Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Ankur Patel. I am the Director of Advancement for Hindu University of America. And uh, we do these weekly Saturday webinars. And today I'm happy and proud to bring you uh, Exploring Hinduism for Teenagers and Parents with uh, Dr. DK Hari and Dr. DK Hemahari. Thank you for being on. And it's been amazing. This over the last two years, Hindu University of America has grown and brought in new people from across the world, experts in their field. Uh, Dr. DK Hari and Dr. DK Hemahari both um, have PhDs from uh, Sri Sri University. They started Bharatyan Initiative in Civilizational Studies back in 2000, and they've been on this journey exploring Hinduism, uh, making it easier for others to understand, sharing it in whatever way possible. And Hindu University of America is proud to partner with them on this, uh, on this course. We offered it previously and we've had great reception, great interest, we're getting better. Um, we're, we're focusing on what the community needs, what the Hindu community needs. And we know there is a big gap between what young people in America absorb and understand and what is really out there. And this course is designed to address that. And so um, we'll take questions after some presentation about the course, what it covers. This isn't an, op I mean, you can definitely ask questions about Hinduism as a part of this webinar, but this webinar is focused on introducing this course to you as an opportunity and a vehicle to explore Hinduism as a family. Ask those questions, engage, and um, again, my name is Ankur Patel, Director of Advancement for Hindu University of America. And our guests today are Dr. DK Hari and Dr. DK Hema Hari, who I will be happy to hand it over to. I'll take questions. You can put it in the chat. Uh, we'll try and answer everyone's questions. Um, I've already dropped some information in the chat in terms of the course. Um, but let's get started. I uh, will hand it over to you. Thank you, Ankur. Thank you. Namaste to all. It's a pleasure to be associated with uh, Hindu University America. And uh, we've already uh, done two courses. We have done one course and we are in the midst of the second course. And this would be the third course. Uh, when we did this course, Exploring Hinduism for Teens and uh, Parents in the earlier semester, it was uh, uh, in the summer period. It was quite well received. And uh, we were happy to interact with a range of students both parents, grandparents, and teens. So we had a whole spectrum of family and the number of questions that we got from the teens was quite encouraging and uh, we were able to interact with them, get to know uh, what their questions are and answer. Some are, are the most of the questions. So it's been a uh, very interesting experience for us also. So today, uh, we will uh, introduce the subject once again, exploring uh, uh, Hinduism for teens and parents. Before that, we'd like to have us sh show you a short brief of what Bharat Gyan is all about. It's a journey that we have had for about 20 plus years now. So we'll just tell you why we started Bharat Gyan and how we have sort of traversed these 20 years. And it's been a very even for 20 years for us and all the people that we have met and interacted with. Uh, when we started off, Two decades ago, there was not much interest in Hinduism or the Indian civilization or Bharatiya civilization, unfortunately so. Uh, but what's uh, the things that have opened up in the last two decades is interesting and eye-opening. Uh, we both have been professionally uh, qualified and employed because of which we could travel the world to many places to almost about uh, 40 countries in different parts of the world over the last two decades. And everywhere where we went, we took an effort to sort of go visit the local uh, sites and what's happening and everything, observe things. So that created an interest among us to study civilizations as a, as a whole and in comparison to the Hindu, Indian, Bharatiya civilization. So we were able to do this from a very civilization perspective and that opened many things for us, which we, now through Bharat Gyan, we're able to share this with all our friends like yourself here. I would like to just share our screen.
And uh, so like Hari said, uh, you know, th these last 20 years of journey, uh, fundamentally we have been compiling the knowledge of the Hindu civilization. So like he said, when we started, the challenge was not only that they weren't, uh, I mean, the interest, people were just throwing nuggets here and there, but it was very difficult to find information, find more details. There would be just headlines, but then if you ask questions beyond that, there were no sources that we could go to other than traditional scholars or really manuscripts, uh, very old manuscripts and uh, old books in libraries. Mind you, 20 years back, you did not have Google then. So you could not go to quickly search for anything. So everything was, was not uh, arm's length away, but quite far away, literally. So you had to go to a scholar or to a library or somewhere to get that information. So if we were living in a different era, literally. And uh, so then we started compiling. So we went through this journey by asking questions, which I'm sure many of you have in your minds today. Uh, and uh, you're also fortunate enough to have many more people today uh, giving you such answers. And we started compiling them, but making it in a form that is, we kind of act like a bridge between the traditional knowledge base and the modern generation, which has these questions. So we try to put it forth in the form of documentary films, short films, and books with a lot of pictures. And uh, the uh, level of uh, writing is such that teens onwards can understand. So from middle school onwards, a child will be able to read and uh, understand about the civilization. The question would be, why did we focus on the civilization as a whole and not just as a religion alone? So if you really look at it, uh, many of us know that uh, you know, if anybody has to succeed, then the foundation that one has, uh, one has to have a very good foundation. One's foundation has to be strong. And this foundation is what we call the roots, is not only our roots, it's also the roots of all the problems that we face today. In, the, in this also lies the roots of what we see around us today. Not only is it the root of our own identity, but all this past history is what collectively has made the today for us. And if we are able to understand these roots and strengthen them, we feel strengthened then, we are able to branch out and we'll be able to succeed wherever we go. And as far as uh, the Bharatiya civilization is concerned, uh, which is what we are also, we found that there are a lot of Hindus all over, not only in India, but spread all over the world. And uh, many of them playing a very, very prominent role uh, wherever they are in the various societies and in global affair, uh, affairs as well. So it is very important that these people are strengthened by knowledge of their roots. And one, the aim will be to connect with themselves, their own selves by understanding what is the civilization they come from. Because religion is just one aspect of the civilization. And you cannot detach and understand religion alone without understanding the other aspects of the civilization of which it is a part. So how do you relate to it? How do you understand its character? How do you understand your own ethos? And once you understand that, then you will be able to realize your own innate potential and strengths you will know what is your USP so that you can innovate opportunities around yourself wherever you are and uh, kind of uh, make yourself relevant for the present times. So that is what uh, is our, uh, has been the focus with which we've been compiling this knowledge because we are you know, kind of at the threshold uh, of the fourth industrial revolution where everything is going to be artificial intelligence. And from there on, you're going to go into the realm of the mind and uh, the Hindus uh, and the Hindu civilization uh, has been one that has understood the mind a lot. So what is the civilization all about? If you are able to connect yourself and find your own roots and strengthen them, then you can be that much better, more relevant in that particular era when it comes. As many of you youngsters are going to be the ones that are really going to drive that particular era. And so we actually look at this study as a stepping stone to help scale up one's own soft skills and uh, provide the confidence and dare to be able to leverage one's own strengths uh, and uh, succeed in that direction. So that is why we have been uh, 
compiling the uh, knowledge about the Hindu civilization, about the Hindus per se as a civilization. And so it goes back to, if you talk about roots, then the question is, who are we? What is our identity? But to come to that, fundamentally, I mean, this is a question that has been uh, uh, kind of, it is at the base of everybody's quest. It is the quest for everyone to know who are we is the fundamental question that drives all of us. But it is not easy to get there without going through all of this. So where did we come from? And this question, if you talk at a civilizational level, it is what is the land we come from? But if you talk as a human, then you're talking about what is the source of creation itself? So your quest spans from earthly levels to celestial levels. So at heavenly levels, so in space, so at both levels, both as cosmic levels. as well as at earthly levels, as this quest has been there. And we look at this geography, you have to then understand the history of this particular civilization, the industry, what did the civilization, what did the Hindus do for a living? How did they go about doing it? Where all did they go? How sustainable how, they were. And how were they organized? And uh, finally, it then comes to how did they keep time at all? How did they look at the skies? How did they understand sciences? How did they celebrate festivals? Because we all know we are celebrating festivals. Hindus are known for celebrating festivals, but then we celebrate it at different times each year. So how do we understand our own calendar, our own timekeeping? So when she says different times each year, it's different times each year in the Gregorian calendar. But in the Hindu calendar, it's at the same time of each year. Because the Hindu calendar follows certain astral uh, logic, logic codes <laughs> system. And use in the English word, you call it festival. What is the word we use in all the Indian languages, Hindu languages, Bharati languages, be it Sanskrit or Telugu or Tamil or Assamese or Punjabi? What is the word we use for festivals? Utsav. The word Utsav is beautiful. It means uplifting. Ut. Uttishta. So uplifting. So each festival is uplifting, both to the body and the mind. Look at how beautifully it's intertwined. And uh, so then we look at our knowledge base. So these are the various aspects. Only when we understand all of this can we really go to our own selves and understand and connect with ourselves and be able to get a feel for who we are. So with that in mind, we have been compiling the knowledge base across all these different compartments. While knowledge per se is not compartmentalized. But for our own understanding and assimilation, we have kind of put them into various buckets. Like identity, geography, history, industry. Because this civilization of Hindus were very industrious people. Look at, let's look at and that is what actually is the course we are currently doing. We are looking at the Hindu contributions to the world in two parts, in the realm of matter and in the realm of mind. So there are, it's a two part course and that is what we're looking, the industry, trade, navigation, all of which helped uh, the Hindus contribute a lot to the world. We and believe uh, we, uh, that they have contributed so much, tremendous. In fact, the world as we see today is a result of the influence of the Hindus over the world. Across centuries and millennia. So from that was born this course, about exploring Hinduism uh, as an overview first uh, to kind of get a feel for what the civilization is about before we go into the details uh, like uh, the contributions, the utsa, uh, the timekeeping and so on as uh, various different courses that we have planned uh, further down the line. And in this particular uh, course, actually, uh, we'll be uh, looking at what all we'll be covering, you know, it's, it's beautiful, amazing. We'll be looking at the land of the Hindus. We'll be looking at the divinities uh, of the Hindus. We're looking at it from five different angles, five main angles. Because it is going to be uh, 20 sessions 
and these 20 sessions are divided into five components. And the third unit will be the calendars of the Hindus, the organization of the Hindu society, and finally the struggles of the Hindus, because we all know that today, when you come and you look at the Bharatiya civilization as a whole, you find a lot of conflicting views, diverse uh, state of affairs. And uh, so how did it get here? Uh, so that is something that we have to be aware of the truth as well. So we'll get into that aspect towards the end of the course. And one thing that we have kept at the center of this, of this whole course, this uh, 20 session course, is a lot of interaction time with the teens and parents. So that as we go through the course, after every three sessions, we have one session where it's almost interaction time so that what they have learned in those three sessions or what they already have feelings, they can interact and share and we can sort of, if there are any misconceptions clouding their minds, we can clear that. So it's going to be a substantially interactive course. That's what it's going to be primarily. So they can get different perspectives on this. So yes, they're going to be sessions where we'll be speaking on the subjects and substantial feedback and interaction is sort of inbuilt into it. So let's get a feel for the civilization itself as a whole. So we start with the land of the Hindus, right? So let's look at, we'll start with a few small short movies. Uh, I will just make sure I can share my computer sound. And uh, Uh, in fact, our course itself, you know, it is peppered with a lot of multimedia presentation uh, and a uh, lot of uh, short films. Our reading material itself has got films embedded into it. And uh, so we will be looking at what were the boundaries of this land, which is called Bharat. Let's look at the boundaries of this land, Bharat as mentioned in our ancient texts. The boundaries of Bharat were well described as the great ocean in the south, that is, the Mahasagar, the high snow-capped mountains, the Himalayas, in the north. Him means snow, Alia means abode, Himalaya means the abode of snow. The easternmost point was known as Arunachal. Aruna means the first rays of the sun. It is not the disk of the sun, but the rays of the sun that precede the rising sun. Achala means hills. Arunachal is the hills that receive the first light. The westernmost hills, which form the boundaries of Bharat, were known as Astachal. Ast means to set, the setting sun as in Suryast. The hills on which the sun sets in the land of Bharat was called Astachal. This whole geographical region has never been ruled by any one king. This land has been won, not politically, but culturally and geographically. This land has been called Bharata. question will be why the name Bharat for this land itself? What does the name itself mean? As per the Indian constitution, this land is called India, that is Bharat. Why does this country have two names? Why is India called Bharat? The word Bharat etymologically stands for bha, that is light, the spreading of light, the knowledge which comes with the spreading of light, and rat, one who is a connoisseur of knowledge.
spread of this land is also expressed in the literature of the land. In the Rig Veda, Rishi Vishwamitra describes the people living in this land as Bharatam Janam. The word Janam means people, citizens. Bharat is the land where people relish knowledge. called Bharatiya civilization. Uh, people usually have many answers. Uh, some would say that it is because of the son of Shakuntala and Dushyant. And uh, some would say it is because of this king Bharata who ruled. And uh, some would say it is because of uh, a rishi by name Jada Bharata. So all of this is true. But it is also a question that we should ask, why did we have so many people who were called Bharat. Why were they all called Bharat? So they were all called Bharat because by nature, the people of this land relish knowledge. And that is why we find this name Bharat right in the Veda itself. So like we saw in the Rig Veda, they we find the name Bharat for this land. So from then on, we have had the Bharata dynasty. We have had King's name Bharat, Rama's brother was called Bharat, Shakuntala's son was called Bharat, this Muni was called Jada Bharata, and so on and so forth. And all the way down till even today, we have many people who are called Bharat. So that is what we have to first understand that Hindus are people who have been relishing knowledge. Now, uh, with this, you know, having looked at the fact of Arunachal, Himalaya, Bharat, uh, something would have, you would have connected, you, you know, there must have been a connect that would have formed in your mind. The fact that almost every word, no, not almost, every word itself, in fact, has a meaning. It is very meaningful. If you know Sanskrit, I, I mean, there are HUA is actually conducting many courses uh, in Sanskrit language. If you know Sanskrit, you will know what each of these words mean, including your own names. And that is why these places have got those names like Arunachal. So automatically, you know, it is the eastern boundary of this land because it is the hills on which the first rays touch this land called Bharat. Or Himalaya, which means it is the place where uh, it, it is an abode of snow. Now, like that, let us look at a few other interesting names, which we just want to show you. These are the kind of things that we cover throughout the course. Uh, now, with respect to land, I would just like to show you a few other uh, such names. Uh, we will uh, first see a film uh, before we uh, go to that. Uh, Let us look at why Tibet is called Tibet. The land to the north of Himalayas is called Tibet. Tibet is called Trivishtab in Sanskrit language. How did Tibet get its name? The Indian plate, slowly moving northwards in the remote past, hit the Asian plate many million years ago. When it hit the Asian plate, it created a crumple. What came of this crumple is a massive range of mountains. This crumpled mountain range stretched from Tehran in Iran in the west to Hanoi in Vietnam in the east. This is what we now call the Himalayan range. This impact had created three crumpled zones in this Himalayan range. The lower range is known as Shivalik, where life exists in abundance. The middle range is known as Mahabharat, 
the great range that encapsulates the northern borders of the land of Bharat. The third and the highest range is called Himalaya, always covered in snow. Because of these three layers or crumpled zones, the flat land on the other side of the Himalayas came to be called Trivishtap, meaning the thrice folded land. This word Trivishtap got anglicized and became Tibet. We thus see that this land Tibet had a scientific name Trivishtap from a geological happening. Let's take a second and uh, yes. adjust the audio. I don't know if yes. uh, there's something on your mic end or if it's on our end. Let's just check, please. Yeah. No. Now there's a echo and the audio is yeah. oscillating. I don't know if you have a different way to plug in or maybe turn off the video for a little bit while the latency catches up. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, now is that better? I have tried switching on the. Uh... All right. Now is it okay? No. Yeah, it happened after the video, so maybe unshare or, or reshare with the different computer audio. Only one should have, maybe because of the extra jack on the mic. Both of you have mics or just one? I mean, that was really interesting, though, the part about Tibet and the different layers, all these different things that they've been sharing have, I mean, really very interesting and new to me also, but I, I'm just talking a little bit while we figure out the audio thing. One of the big things that I think uh, this course can do for young people is it gives Hindu confidence, right? It, it gives uh, an understanding and that grounding that they started with. And as a young person born in America, I didn't have that confidence about what Hinduism was, the history. And I think this would be very good for young, I wish I had this as a young person growing up, because what am I answering these questions to? I didn't even know until now, even though I've been working for Hindu University of America, some of those language and historical things. So it's, uh, I think that's only in half an hour with some audio issues. Please sign up for this course, um, Exploring Hinduism for Teens and Parents. We'll take questions in a little bit. Um, I'm dropping information about the course in the chat. So it starts January 9th. Um, it'll go until March 21st. As uh, Dr. Hurry said, there's going to be 20 courses and they're uh, broken up into different components. Uh, what do you think? Is our audio better? Maybe I can hand it back to you. No. No, unfortunately it is not. And you're still sharing screen. Maybe stop sharing screen. Okay. Uh, stop sharing screen for one second. Is it, is it better now? Without the screen share? No, it's not better. Maybe just uh, uh, drop off for a second and jump back on. If you have questions, yeah, just drop off and jump back on. And uh, if you have questions, you could put them in the Q&A box and in the chat, and I'll, I'll keep track of them. 
and we'll make sure that we get it to uh, Dr. Hurry and Dr. Hurry when they get back on. Uh, you know, sometimes the technical issues come into play, but um, I was part of their summer quarter right? And it was compressed and they have gotten so much better. I could see it in just this presentation now. I highly encourage um, uh, people to start enrolling. I see some questions in the chat. Is my audio distorted also or no? My audio is fine, right? I got a question from Sushila Ji in the, in the participant. I got Vishnu Ji with a hand up. I can unmute you and allow you to talk. I think it's always nice to get interaction. And that's also one of the, the strengths of uh, these online courses is we do want to make sure that we have interaction. We want you and your young people and the kids to be able to ask the questions that are on the top of their minds and then be able to answer the question with this decades of experience that Dr. Hurry and Dr. Hurry bring to the table and hopefully also good audio now. Yeah, yes. I hope now it's better. Yes. Okay, is it good now, our audio? Yes, good, <laughs> wonderful. Good, thank you. All right. So the moment we took the names of divinities, I think the audio worked. <laughs> okay, we just sort of went out and came back, so it, it helped. Okay, okay we'll... Uh... The next point is actually going to be about divinities. Do we, one of the things that uh, people often speak about uh, Hindus is that, uh, oh, you have so many divinities. You have 33 crores. Crores, of course, is a way of Indian counting. And... Uh, so they say, oh, you have so many divinities. Uh, how is this? It's so confusing. It's a confusing religion. Now, uh, just want to draw your attention to this aspect. So the children, especially the teens, are used to this phrase, where on earth are they? <laughs> what on earth is happening? So we are asking this question now to the teens. These 33 crore deva, divinities is the Indian term, is deva, which comes from the word div. The word div means to shine, to glow. Where on earth are these people? That's a fundamental question. The point is, are they really on earth? Or they are everywhere? The fact is, these deva, these divinities, are not just on earth. They are in the solar system, in the galaxy, and everywhere in the whole astral sphere. And each of them is a component of this divine space. And they fully encompass it. That's a and each of them plays an integral, important role in the divinities. So that's one perspective to see that every aspect of nature, Prakriti, is a divinity. And here in this civilization, in Hindu religion, we give them a shape, form, and we have stories around these things to understand these astral phenomena, scientific phenomena, the cosmic phenomena from an earthly perspective. As earthlings, for us to understand this whole cosmos, we build stories around it. Because some of them are fathomable, some of them are beyond fathom for common people. So that's how it's come down to us through the ages in the wonderful formats. That's what you can see. But beyond this, there's also, if you see, each of these divinities, the name tells you a story as to who they are, what they mean, and why do we have, if, suppose if you take, let's take the name Brahma, for example. The word Brahma comes from the word Bra, means to expand, to grow. When you have the Big Bang, the cosmic explosion, what in the Hindu thought is known as Brahma and the Visphotak, the Big Bang, from the cosmic, which in the Hindu thought is called Hiranya Garbha, the golden hued womb. Garbha is womb, Hiranya is golden hued, so golden hued, hued from which everything came. What is the first? objective after the Big Bang to grow to infinite size, continuous growth, instantaneous growth, immeasurable growth. That is Bra, expand. That's why if you look at Mumbai in India, it's called Brihan Mumbai, the large Mumbai. Uh, just one point here I want to draw attention to. Uh, 
uh, if you notice, he spoke about the Big Bang and infinite size expansion. So if you see that it is a religion which is very much on par with what is modern science, scientific thought today as well. It is not in contradiction with modern science. And as we start exploring these divinities, we will keep seeing, in fact, we will, uh, during this course, we will be going through the entire uh, knowledge uh, of the uh, process of creation as it is explained in the Veda, in the Purana. And as we look at each of those steps, we will see how much in sync it is with the modern understanding of the process of creation. In fact, we will even see how it is even beyond present day levels of understanding as well. There are a lot of pointers that this can offer to uh, uh, further research on the process of creation. So that each of the divinities has a role to play. And incidentally, the, the what we call 33 crore divinities is the term that we use where on earth are they? Okay. Are they there? It's called in the Hindu text, it's called 33 Koti. And the Koti word has also has one meaning, meaning crores. The same word Koti has one more meaning called groups. So it's 32, 33 groups of divinities. Categories. Categories of divinities. This we have discussed in a couple of chapters in our book, Breaking the Myths. Uh, you can please check it out when you have the time. It's available. Uh, so that this instantly will also be dealing with in detail as part of the course. So from divinities, we go on to timekeeping, the calendar. Because with each of these divinities, we celebrate their birthdays. We celebrate Ramanavmi. We celebrate... Uh, Janmashtami, Navratri, Navratri uh, then Rissim Jayanti. So, so many, uh, uh, you know, birthdays we celebrate for these divinities. So where these divinities, in fact, during the course, we will see the distinction between a divinity called Vishnu and the divinity called Rama and Krishna. Uh, we will see how do you, uh, why do you celebrate a birthday for Rama, for Krishna, but not a birthday for Vishnu as such. You don't say Vishnu Jayanti, but you say Ramanavmi, which is his birthday. We say Krishna Jayanti or uh, Janmashtami for Krishna. So what is the subtle difference? How do you uh, distinguish between these? So, uh, you know, these are, uh, in fact, even for Shiva, you don't say Shiva Jayanti, but you celebrate Shiva Ratri. So why do you celebrate Shiva Ratri and not Shiva Jayanti? So these are some questions that should be occurring to us that if you, it hasn't occurred to you, we will put those questions in your mind because we had them and that is how we uh, got through our compilation and uh, got these answers together, which we will be sharing with you during the course. And instantly for Shiva Ratri, why do you celebrate Shiva Ratri and not Shiva daytime? So is there a significance to it? Then you don't celebrate Shivara, you don't celebrate it in the morning or you don't celebrate it in the afternoon, but you celebrate it at night. Shivaratri, why? Incidentally, we have short films on this which you can watch in the YouTube, uh, Bharatyan YouTube channel on why Shivaratri is celebrated at Ratri. Each one of them will go into it. Now we look at calendar, for example. This is one of the aspects, key aspects that we'll be dealing with in this particular course. We'll see if you look at uh, the Hindu system, the Indian system of calendars, Bharatiya civilization, you'll be amazed to know that we have 7,300 calendars in the Hindu society. We have languages, a few, at least we have a, a, a dozen official languages and we have a few hundred dialects and languages, similarly we have 7,300 calendars. And how do you manage all these calendars? And they are beautifully intertwined, completely manageable. How and why do we need so many calendars? We have a calendar in Odisha, we have a calendar in Bengal, Tamil, Kollam, Kerala, we have a Changdam calendar there, the Jain calendar, Buddhist calendar, Farsi calendar, Muslim calendar, 
Kartika Chaitra. So, so many calendars. Why do we have so much? Because this has been mentioned in the Calendar Reforms Committee of India in 1950. They enlisted all the calendars. But why so many is what we'll discuss in, in this uh, course. Let's look at one key aspect of timekeeping. Which is common to... Because even though there are so many calendars, all of them follow the same common timekeeping principles. So the principles of timekeeping are common across all of them. And that is what we will try to understand uh, during this course. For instance, time timekeeping, which is called Kala Ganana. Ganana means to count, keep track. And Kala is the word for time. So this timekeeping. See, the word Kala, time, has got a nice word to it. We call it Ahoratra. It comes, it's, it's a joining of two words. Aha means day. Ratri, all of you know, is night. So joining of day and night is called Ahoratra. And Ahoratra is a continuous cycle. Unending, unrelenting cycle that goes on for not just a year, but centuries, decades, millennia, multiple millennia, eons. And era. So that's Aroho Ratra is continuous cycle. And look at the word. If you remove the A uh from here and, and tra from here, what do you get? Hora. The middle word is Hora, from which the timekeeping in the Hindu thought is called Hora, from which you get the Greek word horology, science of time, from which you get the word horoscope, which you look at, and you get the English word hour. It's all got the roots from the Sanskrit word, the Hindu word, the Indian word. The unending continuous cycles of day and night. We'll be discussing about this more as part of the course. Look at and if you look at the way the time has been estimated. Some people, some civilizations had six thousand years. Some have said sixty thousand years. Some have said sixty million years. But look at the Hindu thought. It says Anadi Ananta. Adi is beginning. Anta is end. Anadi, no beginning. Ananta, no end. So, no beginning, no end is, for, is what they say that time is. After having said this, they still calibrate time. They make a master statement, it's got no beginning, no end. Then they start calibrating it to give it the beginning and end. So, it's got both components, which is what we look at as part of the course. Then we look at one particular interesting aspect in this course. Uh, we have all these years, which you said, no, it's Beyond measure, but still we try to measure it to the best of our ability is what the Hindu civilization has said. These numbers, why these numbers? Yuga, Chatru Yuga, Manmantra, Kalpa, Brahma Masa, Brahma Varsha, Parada. Arda, half, Para Arda, beyond half, the two halves. That's what we discuss. And when we say a Sankalpa, we say Brahma, Dvitiya, Parade. We start with that Sankalpa. Why that also we'll discuss in part of the course. Look at Time, let's look at this particular aspect, very important aspect, very interesting aspect in time. Look at time, we know about these terms you've heard of, Krita Yuga, Treta Yuga, Dwapara Yuga, Kali Yuga. These are the number of years, huge number of years. I'm sure none of us are going to live this long to see all these years. But when you add up all this, you get to Chatri Yuga. What does it mean? Let's look at this. Look at the beautiful intrinsic mathematics in this. That's why we say Kala Ganana. Look at this. One Kali Yuga is one unit. Dwapara Yuga is two times that. Dwa. Treta Yuga Tra is three times that. Krita Yuga is four times that. So you add up four, three, two, one, you come to ten. So it's all this decimal, dasa, multiplication of ten. And it is a nice number of reducing number four, three, two. It is not an increasing number of two, three, four. It's not a round number of 1,000 or 10,000. But why is it 432? This is something we'll be discussing as part of the course. And it's a wonderful cycle of nature. It's a ratio of nature. We'll be looking at that in this course. Because it's, it's again, a, it's a multiple of 10. That again, we'll be seeing part of the course. Now, let's look at one more interesting aspect that we'll be seeing in this course. So we'll be looking at the organization of the uh, Hindu society. What has now been unfortunately and erroneously pushed through as the caste system. 
No, we did not have the caste system in the Hindu thought. What we had was the caste system was introduced by the British colonial power in 1871 through a census that they did and called it, they brought in the caste system. Before that, what did we have? So the word caste system comes to the Portuguese word meaning casta. What did we have? We had two other systems called Varna and Jati. The word Varna means Var. Var means, people say var, Varna means color. Yes, Varna means color, but Varna is not color alone. The word Var means to choose. That is why even now in India and many Hindu families across the world, when they choose a bride or a bridegroom, in most Indian languages, you say Varduna to choose. So var means by choice. So based on your attitude, based on your attitude, based on the circumstances, you make choice with your skill. So you choose to be in one of the four varna. So varna is by choice. Whereas your other one, jati, is by janma, jananam, janma, srijan. So it is, you are born into a particular trade guild. You are born into a particular vocation. Your grandfather, great grand. So you are skilled. That particular families were skilled in one particular vocation that kept the civilization moving. But some one or two people or more people in those trade guilds, those families would have felt, I would like to do something else outside this. Because my aptitude is different. My skill is different. My interest is different. So the Varna allowed you to move, be flexible on one scale. The Jati gave you the social security to do your vocation. So it was a, it was a twin system. Look at this. was so well balanced. That is what kept the Hindu civilization moving and functioning, not just for decades or centuries, but millennia. So while Varna was a very flexible, movable thing where you could move across vocations, move across what you wanted to do based on your personal aptitude, the Jati gave you the safety net of skill sets to live in the society and survive and perform well. So that is what was this wonderful thing. But unfortunately, what happened was... It was actually a beautiful matrix. And you could locate yourself anywhere in that matrix. But unfortunately, what happened was, this was morphed into something called the caste system. It was morphed into the caste system and brought in from a very medieval European Christian view that was developed by Saint Aquinas, Saint Thomas Aquinas, he developed a system for Europe, a stratified system where he called it the great chain. And he said, in this chain, who is the sequence? He said the sequence like Pope is number one, kings and queens two, archbishop three, dukes four, bishops five, earls, barons, and all abbots then. Then came the knights and local officials, the priests and monks, squires, pages, messengers. And he put them all down. And finally, it was the gypsies. He said, this is what holds the world together. So this system that was designed about 700, 800 years back in Europe to hold the Christendom them, then, which held them for a few centuries and stratified. You cannot move here and there to stratify that was imposed by the colonial powers and introduced into the Hindu religion and forced on it through the, through the census system, which we'll see more during the part of the course. So fundamentally, the, uh, their idea of hierarchy, of having a hierarchy, was imposed on this flexible matrix that the Hindus were following. And it flattened the whole thing out into a very rigid caste system which has now been cast in stone. Yes. So and this is what we will explore further to understand why did they actually even have these four varnas? Why only four? Why not eight? Why not six? And uh, what about these jatis and uh, various myths that uh, today people carry with them? Uh, how do we understand? How do we clear these myths? So these are things that we will explore further during the Course. Uh, course. And incidentally, those who want to read, don't wait till the course, but want to read about this particular thing before that, because the course is starting on January 9th. There's a book that we wrote a few years back. It's called Breaking the Myths About Society. In that book, we have dealt on this a couple of chapters. Actually, one third of the book deals with this particular subject. You can please go read it there. Okay? It's available there for you to read till then. The next point. 
It's a women who held the, the society, the women who developed the civilization. The Hindu thought, the Hindu idea is fundamental because the women were the backbone. That's the beauty of the civilization where women were actually the backbone and the forefront. And look at this. In the Western thought, in the English thought, what do you say when a man is successful? You say, behind every successful man, there is a woman. That means perforce we say, the woman is behind the man and the man is in the front. This is not said so in the Hindu thought, in the Hindu civilization, in the Bharatiya civilization. What do we say? Not behind, but equal in purpose and act. That's why you say Ardhanari. It's not Ardhanara. It's not the masculine, it's Ardhanari. The feminine form takes a primacy and is Ardha, the half. That's why in marriage, you say the wife is Sahadarmini. And it's not Sama, it's not equal, but it's even better than equal. That is Saha, complementary, together, co, so Sahaya, so Saha. So the wife is Saha Dharmini in all aspects of life. So it gives it a much bigger, wider pedestal. This why, what is the difference between Sama, equal, and Saha, complementary? What are the components of this complementary nature and why it is better to be complementary? We have discussed this part of the course. Because many people ask us, do you ascribe to equality, gender equality of women? We say no, that is past. There's something better and bigger that the Hindu civilizations offer. That is complementariness of the gender. So that is what we always say in, in various conferences of, of gender and women, we speak about that in different parts of the world. So this is there's a beautiful nature called complementary nature, Saha. This is a Hindu thought. We'll discuss about this as part of the course. It's also there in the book. Please, you can see in the book, Breaking the Myths About Society. Next point, please. Then this civilization, the Hindu civilization, has been ravaged, plundered, a prosperous civilization. It's spoken of prosperity right through, right from Vedic times, the civilization has been a prosperous civilization. Hindu thought is a very prosperous thought. Unfortunately, it's been plundered repeatedly. And this land has been, it's not got well because of exploiting others. It was internal resource mobilization generated surpluses and supported the whole civilization and many parts of the world. Let's look at that. In this So this got, because they knew how to use that land, water, vegetation and mines in a sustainable manner. That's what they did because of which this civilization has been a very prosperous civilization, which we see and it has been uh, plundered three times. Once from the far west, I mean, once from the near west, that happened for a few centuries. Mohammed of Ghori, Ghazni to Nadi Shah. The second wave of plunder was from the far west by ships. And unfortunately... That was the colonial plunder. And the third wave of plunder is over the last 50, 60 years, we plundering ourselves. So it's called three waves of plunder. We have written about this in our book, U-Turn India. It's available. We'll be discussing this also as part of the course as to how the Hindu civilization is innately a very prosperous civilization in mindset itself that we'll be discussing. So these are the components of that we'll be discussing, how the civilization was drained, both financially, psychologically, mentally, and various other forms that we'll be looking at in steps. So th this is fundamentally about what we are going to be seeing as uh, part of the course to understand uh, the Hindu civilization uh, itself as a whole. And uh, so this civilization will be covering from a five prong per perspective or a 20 session with a lot of question answers and which we'll be happy to take from the teens and the parents and the purpose why, how this course has been designed for parents and teens and grandparents so that it's not just a course material for you but more importantly, it becomes a family discussion, a family bonding of Hindus and people who are interested in Hinduism. So that across your dining table, in your living room, in your drawing room, in your lawn, you can discuss these aspects and get to understand the ethos of the civilization. So it's designed not just as a tutorial, as a learning, only for your class sessions or 
for reading material, but more for discussion and bonding among the family members. So as she said, it's to me. See, the point is, this particular civilization has been successful for many millennia, uh, except for the last two or three centuries, uh, which is when the plunder really hit us hard. Yes, it has been going on for the last one millennia from the thousand CE itself. We have been feeling the brunt of it. But the last uh, 300 years have been the worst. And uh, it is after that that uh, the civilization uh, has started uh, trying. And uh, it is rising again like a phoenix. But the point is, there are a lot of lessons to be learned from the civilization. How did they conduct themselves? How did they sustain nature, their trade, their prosperity, their progeny, the quality of their life and the quality of their progeny itself? How did they sustain their knowledge base? So many things. Fundamentally, they've sustained a lot. So what are the lessons that we can take from this civilization for going and sustaining ourselves forward uh, in the next coming uh, few millennia. So that is something that is uh, uh, there uh, in abundance uh, in, in trying to get to know about this civilization, which incidentally forms the root for many of the Hindus across the world. And uh, that is the hope with which uh, we would like to present this knowledge base to people so that they can leverage it and uh, take it wherever forward. they are, be it in Fiji or Australia or Southeast Asia or America or Canada or England or Europe, wherever. So Hindus form a very vibrant community. They are a good community everywhere. So the goodness of this community is, should be shared one within ourselves and with our friends wherever we are. Please, Uncle, we'd be happy to take questions Beautiful. now. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing all of that with us. Um, one thing that uh, we're missing right now is uh, Sri Kalyan Vishwanathan, the president of HUA. He yeah, sometimes can join us for webinars. My son is too young, but can I allow him? Please. Yeah. I mean, uh, wonderful. Um, it, yeah. it, it'll be very nice. He can get exposed to some of these ideas. No restriction at all on the age. Ankur, I think that should be fine, right? Yes, no restriction, especially if a parent joins. And yeah, if what if I was somebody from your family people, can also sit with him, it'd be great. Yeah, what I was just going to ask people. And in their twenties, uh, also join the course. Like I had written, uh, yes, yes, uh, yes. tongue in cheek as well. there is no upper age limit. Yeah. Everybody is yeah. a child, and uh, so last please, time we had people who were in eighty year old uh, grandparents who joined the course, and so that they could teach their uh, grandchildren these details in the family. It was very much there, and there is a question asked here. Can uh, I? Can I can I just make a couple statements and then we'll take the questions and then uh, maybe we can unmute people so they can ask you directly so we can have that direct interaction. Sure, sure, sure. Um, uh, but one thing that we'd like to ask and just on the last point that you made is just put in the chat where you're from. What part of the world are you in? I'm in Los Angeles. You know, that's always a nice thing to see filling up the chat as we get into these questions. We have some people with their hands up, Vishnuji and Sushilaji. If you're ready, I can unmute you to let you ask the questions. We're also going through the Q&A. There we go. Somebody from Atlanta and Dallas, Long Island, Chicago, France, New Jersey since 1969, San Diego, Santa Clara, New Jersey, Atlanta, Minnesota, Washington, D.C., right? We have this range of people just on this one call and in the University of America. And this one course is opening that up to everyone. But HUA has a series of different courses. Sanskrit, if you want to get into that, we have a... Oh, and but that's not the focus now. So let's take some of these questions. Uh, Vishnuji, are you ready to ask? I will um, allow to talk. There we go. S Can we just take a question? Uh, oh, go ahead. If you have a specific question you want to take, yeah, go ahead. there is a specific point I want to respond to something. There's a person called anonymous attendee who's asked a question: Is Arya Samaj in conflict with this presentation? Absolutely. See, we have the highest respect for Swami Dhyanar Saraswati of Arya Samaj. Uh, and we respectfully quote uh, his work in a couple of places in uh, during our presentations. And we have also written a very respectful article about the great contributions of Swami Dhyanar Saraswati. And we have interacted with some of the scholars of this uh, parampara with highest amount of respect. So 
it's certainly not conflict, but we are trying to bring in the different parampara into one overall understanding. Great. Yes. So as you moderate your own courses, you know how students ask questions and uh, I don't want to, you know, take over because you, you've been doing well. But I think uh, Prabhatji is ready to ask a question. He's unmuted himself. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Ankur. And uh, thank you, Dr. Harish. Uh, that's a wonderful, actually, introduction and quite a few concepts in a nutshell. Uh, that's uh, very uh, outreaching, very far-reaching, very deep-reaching, I would say. Uh, just a simple question. You did mention the word Parantkal, which uh, I think comes from uh, Munda Kupnisad, the 3.2.6, if, uh, if, if, if my notes are right. What does Parantkal mean? And uh, is it related to the concept of moksha at all? <laughs> and then, by the way, Dayan and Saraswati in chapter nine also mentions no, uh, Parantakal. Yeah, no, no. So we use the word Parardha. Parardha. So, see, in Kala Ganana, there are, uh, see, just like you have the decimal system, tens, hundreds, uh, thousands, and ten thousands, and so on. So here you have in Kala Ganana, you have Yuga, you have Chatur Yuga, uh, then you have uh, Manmantara, Kalpa, Kalpa and uh, so on. Brahma Masa. Then you come to Para Ardha. So Ardha is half, Para Ardha is the other half. But there are terms like Parantakal also, uh, not as part of this uh, uh, scale, but as a separate unit of measure. Uh, see, there are various different other units of measures uh, that uh, people have calculated. In fact, when as you do the course, uh, you will also learn. See, today, if somebody says yuga, and we also showed you that uh, yuga of 43200, you have uh, Kali Yuga, Chat Dwapar Yuga, Chatur Yuga. Okay. And when anybody says yuga, immediately people think of these large uh, millions of numbers, right? But a yuga also means one year. Because if you look at all the Telugu people and many people Canada. from Karnataka, from uh, Maharashtra. Maharashtra, their new year is Yugadi. Yuga Adi. Beginning, Beginning of a Yuga. So for them, every year is a Yuga. What is Yuga? Yuga is an alignment. Yuga, Yoga, Union, Yojana. So it's coming together is a Yuga. So okay. Earth, Moon, Sun coming together is a Yuga. So every year is also a yuga. This we written a full article in the Bharat Gyan blog. You can please check it out only on the word yuga. There are at least three articles on the subject. And also in our book, Historical Krishna and Historical Rama, we've written two full chapters on this word yuga alone. Why yuga is 432000 plus why yuga is also one year. And in Mahabharata, you have yuga as five years. Why five years? That is also there. You can please check it out. There are 60 year yugas. Manav Yuga is 60 years. That is why 61st year you celebrate as Shashti Apta Uti. You complete one Manav Yuga of 60 years. Why is 60 years a Manav Yuga? Shashti means 60. Apta means years. Uti is completion. completion. So completion of a 60 year cycle. Now why 60? Why not 50? 50 is a golden jubilee, a much better rounder number to celebrate. Why not 50? Why do we uh, celebrate the 60? So, There's a meaning for it, and we explain that in the course. Why 60? And why is it only at the completion of 60? So There's these a, are so many such things. So Parantakal and all, they're all various units of time, uh, which uh, they have uh, used for various purposes uh, in uh, different contexts. Yeah, in this information that I received, I did go through those calculations of yoga and all that. It came out to be 311.04 trillion years, actually. So, and, and the calculations you showed, thank you very much. Yes, I have gone through that. So I do understand everything you said, actually. Very, very good. Thank you. Namaskar Great. as well. Great. I don't what think you can What we have see to be them. amazed about is they have thought of such huge numbers and it is not without meaning, just not Sign randomly, yes. but for a purpose that they have calculated such large numbers. So what are those various kind of purposes is... Uh, uh, very, very uh, intriguing, interesting, and amazing uh, really? to learn about. Very revealing, really actually, of lots of information, as you shared. Sorry. No, that Thank was you, wonderful. Sir.
Question, please, Uncle. So that was a perfect example. Any relationship with moksha? Just quickly, a very anything with moksha related in parant kal. Yes, we'll be doing it. Yes, we'll be doing about naraka, swarga, naraka. We'll certainly do on, on one bit on why that because you'll get to moksha. Obviously, when you speak about society, yes, we could speak about the ashrama, and we'll all speak about swarga and naraka. Yes, we'll be doing it, sir. We'll be yes. looking at all the four purushartha, the dharma, artha, kama, moksha. So all of that, what does it mean? Absolutely. And, uh, and why the word swarga? Where is swarga? Geographically, will you address of where swarga is? <laughs> <laughs> it's all, and, and what is naraka? Yeah. Yes, we've been doing two words. Certainly, yes. So, so that one question was very informative, right? Uh, not exactly on what everyone else was thinking about. There's so much. Everyone is thinking about something else. Uh, the question was asked, and it turned into a five-minute answer that cited essays and books on a single word. There is so much depth to everything. It's hard to manage and organize all of this information. And so the hurries have done a great job in figuring out how to present it in a course. Right now we're at 10.06. The, the presentation was great. We're gonna go until 10.30. We've got some more questions and I wanna allow you to elaborate, but then we've got a lot of people who have a lot of questions. So just let's, uh, Let's go through this as we continue. And I'll continue to answer the technical questions, how much it costs, when we sign up, dropping the links in the chat so that we don't have to take up time doing all that. The webinar replay of this entire thing will be made available to anyone who uh, fills out the surveys. So is this course available in different languages? Nirmala uh, Reniji asked that. And so the medium that we're using is English, but I know you have a, maybe you want to touch on that a little bit. Yeah, English is a medium, sir. Because Hindu University of America's medium is English, we'll stick to that. And you have a lot of other things in different languages that you've offered and connected to, though. Yes, uh, yes, we can do it in Hindi or Tamil, but th that's not the policy. Yeah, here, English, yes. Yeah. Um, any other questions that you wanted to take that you were looking at? No, no somebody has mentioned about Jati Varna being very, uh, what do you call, uh, stratified. No, Jati Varna by design and nature, Varna is not the very word. Varna means it is migratable. So, and it's only caste system is cast in stone. Not Varna. Varna is the very word system is migratable. For example, people have asked me what? I've said I started my life because Balmiki says anybody who starts life till the education is a Shudra. We'll deal with that in when we do the course. Actually, we'll be quoting we'll the course. Then when you start studying any course, be it Veda or you do technical training skill in a TT institute or in a school or nursery school, then you become a Brahmana. Because you're starting to learn, study, expand your horizon. The word Brahma means expand. You're expanding your horizon of knowledge. That's what you're doing. Yeah. Then when you get to work to something, when you work in an office, if you're in your business, you're a Vaishya. If you're going to work for somebody as a blue collar labor, then you're a Shudra. Then, so we, I was working for somebody. I, have, I was doing my business. So I was a Vaishya. After my education, after my MBA, for a, for a decade. Then I worked for somebody for a decade. So I was a Shudra. I was working to the dictates of the organization. I was labor. So then what did we, we both decide? We both decided that we'll study, no, we'll get back to knowledge and we'll work on the field of knowledge. So we became a Brahmana. So we have migrated different decades of our life into different aspects of Varna. We personally have. Like then we have many examples in India. We'll take those examples also. Yeah. As we go along. And the this course. is actually a couple of questions here, Ankur. Uh, let me just, let me just add time. to that. The, that one question on caste comes up in so many different ways and so many, we're going to have a full course on that at a high level yes. where we're dissecting it. Uh, uh, but that was a great answer to, 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 clarify the myths that are put on us, that are cast upon us, even though those aren't our ideas or our beliefs, right? So that's, I think, the framework that we have to look at. And all that other language, untouchables and such stuff, there's a lot there. We got to look into it. We got to study. We will. Let's not get into that now. Let's keep on going. But uh, we know that's an ongoing issue. And again, we're going to have a whole course, high-level stuff. We have webinars. We've had two webinars in the past. And uh, the hurries are going to do a good job of answering that question in even more detail in exploring Hinduism. Uh, we understand this is minute, an issue. Uncle, on the word untouchability and practice of untouchability, the why and how of what, what's right, what's wrong, 
we will be discussing as part of the course for quite some uh, length, length of time. At length, we'll be discussing with exact quotes and the examples. We'll be doing that. Uh, the other thing is, uh, there are a couple of questions here. Uh, uh, I think uh, one person, uh, Harish, has asked, I have not heard about Jati being imposed by Europeans. It's already in our oldest book. Yes. We didn't say Jati is imposed by the Europeans. What we said is, yes, Jati and Varna has been there in Indian thought all the way from Ramayana and Mahabharata. And before. Because, and before, because that has been the Hindu system of organizing society. What has happened is, now that organization was a very flexible organization. And what happened was in Europe, when they started organizing their society in a very hierarchical manner, in a very rigid manner, that thought was imposed on the Indian society and it flattened the existing Jati Varna system into a caste system. So Jati Varna system is not the caste system. They are two different entities. The caste system is a reflection of the kind of hierarchical thought which existed in Europe. And uh, we will see the, uh, the uh, peculiarities, I mean, the, the uh, value of the Jati Varna system, uh, like somebody had asked even before that uh, about, uh, 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 you know, uh, the migration of this, about how do you choose your guna? You don't choose much of your guna that is determined by your Jati. Because what is Jati? It is where you are born. And where do you get your guna from? It is part of your genes. So your guna, your genes, much of it is inherited, majority of it is inherited by your jati. The rest is what you, you work around it and you can uh, uh, either uh, develop on it or work to alter and uh, you know, cover up deficiencies or strengthen it and so on. And that is when you can get into move to different varnas by choice depending on your changing guna. Anyway, we'll discuss this more in the part of the course. Next, can I take another question from uh, Padma? She's asked specifically, oh, thank you for appreciating your presentation, Padma Ji. You've spoken about the 10 avatara. The word avatara itself means avatara means to descend. So everybody is an avatara in, in our opinion of the divine. We have also descended from the divine. So we are also avatara. Here in Vishnu, there are 22 avatars, 24 avatars, many, many calculations of, of avatars. Das avatara is one form of calculation which has become popular over time. So you, you have uh, all the Sanat Kumara of Brahma are also avatara. That also you have, which will be de dealing when you deal on evolution. We'll certainly deal about it on the term evolution in Hindu thought as a specific name. It's called Parinama. Nama, name, Parinama, the change. The change that occurs is Parinama. So we'll be dealing with it. See, Buddha, as you asked in the question, is he part of the avatar or not? Is Balrama part of the avatar? It's the perspective look at. Because the Hindu thought tries to assimilate and bring everything together. So when you bring things together, you try to bring Buddha also as part of the avatar. So that is how you, you sort of bring everything in. You have Mohini is also an avatar. A feminine form is also an avatar. Sasta Ayyappa is an avatar. So different avatars are there, different numbers are there. So everything is an avatar. You are also an avatar because you also descend from the divine. You certainly are an avatar. Your, your great forefathers were avatars. Your succeeding generations are also avatars. So noble avatars, divine avatars, each one. It's for us to recognize our divinity and elevate ourselves. Utsav, Uttishta. Thank you. Great. Uh, yes, Vishnuji has got his uh, mic unmuted. I don't know if you're ready to ask a question. Vishnuji or S.A. No, I didn't want to ask. I was. No, no th thank you. No? Okay. I, I find thank you for being interesting on. And I want to compliment. I want to compliment. All right. And both Dr. Hari for this very enlightening talk. I look forward to attending a course. I'll also next time I go to India buy all their books. <laughs> 
Oh, that well, was coming I'll, up. Um, in I'll terms of yeah, purchasing yeah. your books, where would be the best place? And then I'll get you USA. So thank you, Vishnuji, for uh, that. Kin, I was just continuing on Kindle. that. Uh, Vishnuji, thank you for your appreciation. Kind words of appreciation. Thank you so much. All our books are available on Kindle in the Bharat Gyan website. B-H-A-R-A-T-H-G-Y-A-N. Bharat Gyan website. All our books are available on Kindle. Please do pick it up. And uh, uh, our books are available at uh, theartoflivingshop.com also, the physical books. And uh, if you uh, uh, approach uh, Garuda Prakashan, they can reach out the books to you in America. They have a facility to reach out the books to you in USA. In oh, do they? In okay. So that was my Garuda question. Prakashan .com. Great. I say that was your question? Yep, that was what I wanted. Thank you for know. being on. All yep. right. I got to uh, uh, go to is uh, Manohar, uh, Manohar Mahavadiji. You want to ask a question? I got Manas, Manasji, and I got Keshab, Keshab Chopra. So Thank you, Uncle Thank you. Uh, you Uncle Ji, this is Manohar Mahavadi from Fremont, California. Oh, nice. Welcome. And uh, firstly, let me express my tremendous appreciation and joy when I came to know about HUA and the mail I received by, forwarded by Anandji of Livermore Temple, Shiva Vishnu Temple, Livermore. This is the best day, I would say. Uh, I, have no, I have no words to express my joy. Because I've been interacting with youth um, in Bay Area, and uh, I've been interacting with parents. There's a tremendous amount of confusion, a lack of pride in their heritage and Hindu, uh, their parents, what they are doing. They're completely mistaken by the notion that Hinduism means doing some pujas every day and going to temples and then you know, getting lost in those things. So really, uh, I have grown up children. I have a son and daughter who are very grown up, like 31 plus and 29 plus. I interacted with them and I learned. So finally what I did, and I took a lot of, I'm taking a lot of interest in Livermore. I'm a part of Livermore Temple in um, whatever way I can do it. But this mail, which I received about your seminar and, and your, this webinar and these things, really I was waiting because I'm looking from a very scientific and practical point of view about Hinduism, more than the ritualistic side of it, because we are in a great distress at this time, our children basically. So this is a great platform. So before that itself, and it coincided with my thought, and we have, I'm organizing global Hindu teens conference, a virtual conference, a competition where I'm awarding even cash prizes to the youth to participate, to get motivated, to do some research and study and study about the contributions of Hindu society to the overall development and growth and peace and harmony of the world. Uh, this is a great university. This is a great lot of books and the amount of work you have put in is, I have no words to express. Thank like you, I would like to attend this course and as well as I would like to uh, part of whatever way I can do you know, to, to really uh, provide my, you know, make, make your efforts more productive and worthwhile. And thank you very much, Hariji. I don't want to take more time. And I just want to, for the audience, I just I was typing something, but please go to Livermore Temple website and see I'm organizing it and I'm also spreading this message. So as many, and for the global, for Indonesia, for Fiji, for Dubai, you know, people can participate and get some cash prizes because they can do some research. In fact, your platform has so much literature. They can depend on your platform and your HEA website to, to learn and then speak about it for three to six minutes and send me a video clip. Uh, and then we will select uh, the good speakers and good content. Yeah. You know. We're looking forward to partnering with you on that. We'll connect you offline. Uh, we're at 1018. We have about 12 more minutes. Thank you, Manoharji. We'll look forward to that. And then we'll, I think we will be, I have to run it by Gayanji and other people, but I think we will participate in support. Uh, if you want to say anything on that or do we want to unmute uh, our next uh, question? Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Ankurji. Thank you, Dr. Hari. And uh, I forgot, I don't know, know, I know the name of <laughs> Mrs. Hari. And uh, Hema, Dr. Hema Hari. Dr. Hema Hari, thank you so much. And, and I'm very excited, actually. Thank you. Thank you. So I look forward to seeing you in the course, sir. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Definitely. And uh, there's a question from Chris Matelji. And uh, sir, certainly uh, you're welcome for the course. And uh, I'm sure when you talk to your children and grandchildren every day after the course, you'll sort of slowly, step by step, get them interested in it. That's how it happens. Because when we started our uh, research 20 years back, it not that we had all the interest. It was actually a step-by-step -step process, one step at a time. And I'm sure we will uh, uh, cover a lot of ground, certainly. And, and you can let your youngsters know that 
this particular course is uh, beyond just religion and rituals. Uh, it is to get into the fundamental uh, roots about the identity and about why we are who we are and why we are doing what we are doing. So that, that is perhaps something, that, uh, a message you can take to them uh, to see if you can uh, bring them in. And then you can certainly tell your grandchildren that they are welcome to ask any number of questions and any question, we'll be happy to take the questions and learn along with them about understanding of Hindu civilization, of Hindu ethos. And we'll, one thing, we'll not be touching rituals at all in our course. It's not a ritualistic course. It's looking at the from a much larger perspective. In fact, we'll be getting down to the logic and rationale and the science the, in yeah, Hinduism. Yeah. All right, good. All right, Ke Keshavji, I'm sorry I was uh, unmuting you and muting you again. Are you ready? It's okay, it's okay I'm ready. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ariji, and everything. And for this Bhagavad Gita, I'm a student of Bhagavad Gita for the last 20 years. And from my perspective, my little understanding, Chatur Varnaya Maya Sristam Gun Karn Vibhaksha, Lord Krishna told, and this Lord Gita is universal, not for Hindus. It's beyond universes as well, not only this universe. So Chatur Varnaya was as declared by him five more than 5,000 years ago, but he said when this sun was incarnated, you got at that time he told this knowledge to him. So Chatur Varnaya Varans made for by Lord Krishna per Gita. So that's my request. Yes, sir. We'll be mentioning the same quotation and looking at its uh, different perspectives as part of the course. This is a very respectful quotation from Bhagwan Sri Krishna himself. We'll certainly be looking at it and discussing it as part of the, the course. Thing is, I wanted to, thank you very much. Other thing I wanted to add, add is a uh, uh, my goodness. Uh, I mean, all right. Uh, sorry, I think that was me. A victim, a victim, victim, apnam mannete maam, a buddhya, a buddhya, says he takes of Tara. That's again very difficult to understand, but very deeper meaning. Uh, sorry to they say that. Please look into that as well. Sure, sure, certainly, sir. Yes, he will. He doesn't Thank incarnate. Yeah. Okay, Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, I've got Manas. Manas G. I'm having little issues with the allowing people to unmute. I don't know if there are other questions in the Q&A that you were looking at. Um, uh, no. We have about uh, hello. Uh, oh, there you go. Okay, Dr. Yeah. Hariji and uh, Dr. Hemaji. It's an excellent program. I'm very happy to attend this session. Uh, and it's the, I mean, beginning of the Hinduism to, I mean, let our kids and other young one teenagers to know about it. I'm from India, actually. So I'm very excited to uh, get involved with you guys with a lot of spiritual knowledge with scientific and logical meaning. So it's a uh, heads off that you started this session and Hope we'll continue our journey and make more people aware. Welcome, That's all. Sir. Thank you so much for your words Thank of appreciation, you. kind words. Thank you. You're welcome for this uh, course. You're welcome to introduce your friends, sure. both in India and US for this course. Sure, sure, sir. I'll, I'll do that. Yeah. Your Thank you. Friends and colleagues. Thank you. Thank right. you. Thank you Thanks a lot. Good. All right. Monastery, um, I'm going to put you back in the audience. Uh, hello. Shripaji. Yes. Or, there you go. Should I uh, go ahead? Just uh, so actually, I put a question in the chat, which I was uh, I like this interpretation of Jati and Varana. So my question is: If today a Muslim or a Christian wants to join Hindu fold, in which Varana or Jati would he be admitted? Good question, sir. This is many people asked. Depends upon if he's going to be a professor or scholar, then obviously he becomes a Brahmana. If he's going to be in the trade, if he's going to be doing business. Is going to be on industry, he is going to be in Vaishya. If he is going to be in uh, the force, armed forces, or administration, he is going to be a uh, 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 Kshatriya. If he or she, not he or she, are going to be in the labor force. So, yeah. which part of the life, what they're going to be, is dependent upon that. If they're going to be in the labor force, they're going to be in the Shudra community. 
Okay, yeah. it depends upon which see, and they can migrate every few years or every they can migrate. It's yeah, I, imminently I, migratable. That, yeah, yeah, what I'm saying is now I am talking about the implementation because it is not only about Varana and Jati. So the point is he he will have difficulty because which jati will he be taken? So the moment the question, good question. I'll answer this point, sir. Any uh, other people coming from other religions, if they come into the Hindu fold, they can do a pancha samskaram and they can choose their varna. Or if they they could take an egyopavitam and uh, say the Gayatri, then they obviously come into the Brahmana Jati. So the choice is theirs actually. Uh, okay, one point hmm. here I would like to draw your attention, Sripadji, is uh, you know when we look at uh, the various industries that were practiced uh, by the civilization, you will find that there were special jatis that were at, uh, doing certain uh, vocations, like some who were dyers, some who were weavers, some who were agriculturists, uh, some uh, in various kinds of arts and crafts. Each one was specialized by a particular trade guild. Now, if you look at a person who is a Muslim or uh, uh, whatever, Jew or a Christian, or especially anybody. if they were in India uh, earlier, they have obviously become so after a process of conversion from Hinduism itself. So they would have been part of one of these trade guilds or the other. And by nature, they would have uh, been inheriting that kind of gene to be able to uh, uh, you know, modulate their uh, thinking and character in that manner. So they, they, in, in a sense, they would be part of that jati. But let me tell you yet another thing. See, all this Varna and Jati is only to the extent of doing work in society. Fundamentally, your living, your values are not guided by your Varna and Jati. They are guided by Dharma. Dharma is different from Varna and Jati. So irrespective of whichever Varna and Jati, Varna and Jati were designed only so that a town or a village or a city could perform in a very coherent, cogent manner, pretty much like an office works today. In an office, you have the same four categories. So it is all to do only with your working and not so much as your value system or your uh, the way you live. Your living is fundamentally to be driven by dharma. She's explained it very well. I'll just take one more point. We're going to explain this in further detail in the course. See, you, you got four ashrama. Brahmacharya, Grihastha, Vanaprastha, Sanyasam. Right? All your Varna Jati is only valid only for a Grihastha ashrama. It is not valid for the other three ashrama. So don't, let's not be clouded only by this. It is only for one when you are in a productive phase of life. Only it's valid. Not the others. Of the four, only for one fourth it's valid, and we are making a big motor out of it because we even imposed the caste system was imposed on us. So we'll discuss this in the part of the course. Let's take two, three more questions quickly because it's just a just couple of more minutes. Shobha Swamiji, thank you so much for your uh, kind words of appreciation. And uh, about let's take Danuji, you look like you're ready to ask your question. Yeah, hi. Please keep uh, it short. Yeah, hi, Danu Krishnamurti. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, and my question is. Uh, I know, you know, I, I'm, I'm born as a Brahmin, yes. My husband is not a Brahmin, yes. But for me, right from the beginning, even when my parents, my father is a priest, my, so my brother is a priest right now, and we have our own temple in Karwar, which is 135 years old. I respect all those things, you know, I respect the chanting and everything. But caste system nowadays in this day, you know, it is not useful. So now from the past few days, I have been doing the... Um, uh, ISKCON course, you know, the Bhagavad, the Bhagavad Gita course. And every chapter has a lesson which these kids nowadays, I have a 28 year old and a 21 year old. They can learn from this. Chapter three, it says, you do not have a right for the fruit. That means you have your, your uh, house, your degree, your status, your job, your money, your cars, no value. But still Indians in America are proving that that's the number one priority. 
I am seeing here. They have their BMWs. They have their Mercedes. They have their fancy houses. So these are the values which we are not teaching our children, right? Am I right? And then on chapter five, it says, "Doing your duty without attachment." So we have to raise our children, but we are not supposed to be attached to them. So these are the lessons are so useful, I think, for this period. You know that this generation, the kids who are growing up right now. So where this caste system and all that, you know, it's waste of time for me. Okay, for me, it's waste of time, especially now in this time. I think okay, that we set that on the side. So, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. All right. Uh, uh, last. Oh, we're at the top of the hour. Raviji, you're unmuted. Are you ready to ask your question? Maybe we, I don't know. Can we go another five minutes? How do you feel? And then yes. give you a chance to close, and then we can make sure everyone has their at least technical questions answered. All right, Raviji, let's. Your My turn. question is mainly about the course. When does it start, and is it like a fixed timing every day, or once a week, or is it online? Or I mean, what what's the uh, mechanism of it, and how long? It starts. Uh, I, 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 I'm sure Ankur ji will be able to answer uh, with details. Just it starts on January 9th. It's twice a week in the weekends. It's a one and a half hour course for each session. So actually, one hour course. We'll be taking a lot of question and answers. So it, Normally spills to about ninety minutes. Technically, it's a one hour course, but please cushion up for for say one and a half hours. It's uh, two sessions a week in the weekends. The details, all that are available on the website and with with uh, Ankur Ji. I put it in have... the chat. The link is right there. Just to reiterate, starts on January 9th. It's every Saturday and Sunday, eleven a.m. Eastern to noon Eastern. Um, and as uh, was mentioned, and as this webinar shows, the questions keep on expanding. So if you cushion for more than that hour, you will get um, your questions answered. So the way that we're offering the course also is the first person who enrolls is $200. Every person thereafter is $100. We set you up with an HUA email ID. You get your login. Uh, uh, all the information is made available. It's linked to our university address and all of those sorts of things. We're here to help you on this journey. We want to make sure that you understand. We want to make sure that we answer your questions. We'll be sending out follow-up emails. The survey is going out. I put that up several times in the chat. Um, uh, thank you so much for participating. I hope to see you in this class. This is getting better and better. All of our work is Do getting college? better and better, quarter by quarter. And I want to give the last word to the hurries to um, close the one. webinar. One very interesting question that we would like to take here. Uh, I'm sorry if we have not been able to answer all of them, but as we are scrolling up and down, uh, we are just trying to pick up some of them. Uh, there has been a question as to why aren't we calling it Sanatana Dharma and uh, as uh, Hinduism, uh, where is uh, ism in Hindu faith? Uh, see, fundamentally during this course, we will realize the difference between Dharma. See. Uh, something over time has happened where uh, very casually the word for religion itself has become dharam. Whereas we will try to, uh, we will get to understand what really dharma is, what is religion, what is philosophy, how do you separate all of them and uh, also you will understand what really is Hindu religion even as we call it as a religion. Uh, was it really a Hindu religion? Is that the word that has been existing from uh, early on from the Vedic times? And uh, uh, we, you know, there are a lot of misconceptions around the word Hinduism and the Hindu religion, uh, like you have rightly asked. So we will be understanding all of this and separating it out from what is Dharma. So uh, the, these are some things that uh, definitely we will... Uh, See, religion fundamentally comes from the focus on God, whereas dharma is even beyond gods. So we will I, I have, look at we look at the word dharma itself in one session. What, we'll analyze the word dharma instantly. If you go to our book, uh, Breaking the Myths and Brand Bharat, we had discussed two chapters on the word dharma. Please check it out. And we have an article in the Bharat Gyan blog on the word dharma alone. Yeah, I have a quick question. Can I ask now? Please, quickly. Yes. Uh, yeah, um, there is so much literature about this quantum physics and Vivekananda Ji's... Uh, Doubt us, uh, I can't hear you. Uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, literature about uh, Swami Vivekananda 
on the connection between quantum physics and the hinduism did you, does your course cover aspects of that as well not directly but we have written article on this in our uh, blog on the connection between swami vivekananda and tesla they have written two articles on please check it out sir okay. we right. have written about it in the bharat gyan blog okay i will check okay all right um, there's a, still more questions coming in um let's do Go closing ahead. statements make your pitch for why people should enroll i think i'm 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 making that pitch for you actually again i think that idea of confidence hindu confidence especially in our youth is what you will be getting for your uh, young people and for yourselves if you know I, again i'm 35 and i every day i'm learning more about this and it makes me more confident in my own hindu beliefs and faith um and, and i'm just glad to be a part of this happy to share this um dr hemahari dr dikhari closing thoughts thank you for doing this for us and being a part of this i think this time this course uh, the timing is such that uh, your friends uh, across the world also can uh, participate so you could uh, you know kind of encourage them if you have liked these ideas and uh, you would like them also to benefit from uh, uh, these kind of uh, nuggets of information uh, you could uh, encourage them as well to join Uh, like people from Europe and all that, they could. This this timing is quite suitable for, suitable for them for. as well. See, the one of the key things about the Hindu thought is when we we say sang sangat chatwam. That is when we see a good idea, we try to bring more people to it. That is satsang. So in that perspective, when you see there's a something good happening, it's always nice to bring our friends and colleagues along with it. That's the beauty of it. So. Uh, uh, please do bring sir let us all journey together and take it forward and there's a question by ravi kanna about uh, credits yes it's it, this course has got credits you can check up with uh, ankur ji and uh, the uh, university details about the, the about the credits yes please do thank you thank you we'll be in touch thank you for being a part of this namaste everyone hope you enjoy the rest of your day bye bye our pleasure interacting with all of you namaste namaste